Hello, everyone, and welcome to the public board meeting for Upwardly Global. Um, I'd like to thank all of our board members for joining us uh, today, as well as um, our leadership council members, our ambassadors, as well as some of our critical corporate partners and institutional donors, as well as volunteers and staff. So thank you all for joining us today. Um, we will be recording this session uh, for those of you um, who, are, who are here or who uh, want to have other people be able to make it. Um, and the goal of today's session is really to talk a little bit more about how immigrant and refugee women can solve workforce gaps and strengthen our communities, um, and to be able to tell all of you guys, our community, um, about the critical issues where Upglow has insight and potential to play a vital role. So with that, I'll turn it over to Gina. Hi, everybody. Nice to see everybody on the call. Um, so yeah, I mean, you know, at Upwardly Global, we've been going through this journey around understanding and deepening our work with our population. Um, at the last ambassadors meeting, we had research from PwC and we talked about where we were um, successful and where we had opportunities to improve. And one of the things we wanna do now um, as an organization is center some of our work, not all of our work, but center some of our work around women and looking at those additional barriers that women face in order to integrate into the workforce at their skill level. One of the reasons this is important to us is, is because we know that women face additional barriers. Um, today, I have a panel of incredible women who are gonna be speaking, not only about the outcomes of, of which women um, in the workforce, what that looks like today, um, but also some of the barriers that they face and, and uh, from their own research, as well as um, from their own work experience or their own experiences. Um, you know, Upwardly Global has made a long time commitment to ensure uh, parity in terms of the number of uh, women and men that we serve. And we've come close to 50%. It's a number we're very proud of. It's a number that's not common in most workforce um, organizations. And it's something we're deeply committed to. But we're also committed to ensuring that there's equity as part of that. So that women are, we're addressing the gender wage gap that we're looking at gender norms that make it difficult for women not only to enter into the workforce, but in order to thrive in the workforce. And we also know that because our women job seekers not only come from various cultural contexts that have their own uh, gender norms and constraints, but they're also coming into a US context where we also have different gender norms and different gender constraints. And so navigating that becomes a challenge. Um, this, this conversation to us is really urgent at this time. One of the reasons is not only because of the 3 million women who have left the workforce during the pandemic, but also because as we're looking at some of these larger refugee crises um, that are at, around the world, in particular, the Ukraine crisis, we see that it's largely and predominantly impacting women. Um, so this is a question we've got to solve and we wanna solve quickly. So you're gonna uh, hear more from us uh, throughout the years about how we're centering some of our work around women. We thought this was a great launch and kickoff call. I want to um, introduce uh, our speakers. So our first speaker is going to be Jana Batalova, who is uh, a researcher at the Migration Policy Institute. Uh, Jana is also an, an immigrant herself from Ukraine. And she is, I would say, one of the foremost researchers on brain waste. Um, and has not only looked at this across the board in the United States, but also in specific sectors like healthcare. Um, then we'll also have Zuhal Salim. She's a woman's activist from Afghanistan. She is, we now have the privilege of working with Zuhal at Upwardly Global. Um, and she'll be speaking also about women activists, um, the barriers Afghan women face. And then Tastiana Mello, um, who is with the Girls on the Road as co-founder. She's originally from Brazil. She now works at Accenture in DEI and communications and is also an Upwardly Global alum. We're thrilled to have all of you here. I am gonna go ahead and kick off the conversation. So Jana, I wanna turn to you first and ask, what do we know about immigrant women and employment in the United States? And as you're looking at the data, um, do you see this as a missed opportunity for the country and how do you think we can address that? Thank you, Gina, for the introduction and for the invitation to speak. I'm delighted to see so, so many familiar faces, but also some, so many new faces. Uh, so let me start uh, with some global context. Uh, for a long time, when migrants crossed uh, the international borders, they were mostly men in search of 
jobs. And when women did cross an international border, it was mostly uh, as part of the family unit. And a lot has changed in the past 40 to 50 years. The gender and family norms uh, combined with uh, fertility patterns are shifting, granted faster in some countries than in others, nonetheless. Uh, the level of education is uh, rising uh, across the world and in many Western countries like the United States, uh, women in fact are leading the way. And the economies uh, of many destination countries are uh, shifting toward service-oriented jobs and sectors, as well as knowledge-based uh, uh, sectors. And women, migrants and native-born women alike, are well-suited to participate in, in, in these economies. In the United States, women and girls make up 51% uh, of the 45 million immigrants. Uh, as mothers, workers, and students, they uh, make important contributions to local communities, the economy, and the society. Think of hundreds of Filipino nurses who joined uh, uh, their US born and other immigrant counterparts at the, at the front lines fighting the pandemic. Uh, think of uh, uh, childcare workers from um, Jamaica or the Dominican Republic. Um, the uh, Indian computer engineers who are working for Amazon, famous actresses like um, Salma Hayek and writer uh, Nazar Afizi, and a fashion mogul, um, uh, Diane von Furstenberg. So these are women who we know and who we very well and, and who might not well, know very well, but they are uh, part of the a large number of um, um, a large portion of the U.S. population. Immigrant women come from diverse um, ethnic and linguistic backgrounds. They have varied levels of education and experiences. And this, these characteristics uh, shape a lot uh, the experiences in the, in the United States. One group of immigrants that, we, uh, that I focus on in my professional work is highly educated women. There are two good news. One is that uh, close to 7 million immigrant women in the United States have at least a bachelor degree. They, they account for 51% uh, of all college educated immigrants. Uh, the second good news is if we look at the recent arrivals, men and women alike are significantly more likely to be educated than those who came in the past. Just to give you a, a perspective, um, almost half of recently arrived immigrant women have a bachelor degree or more, and that's compared to 32% uh, of immigrant women, uh, other immigrant women, and 34% of US born women. So half versus a third. Uh, however, um, these college educated uh, women are more, more, more likely to be disconnected from the workforce. We find that 31% um, of college educated immigrant women are out of the labor force, uh, with uh, the share even greater if these women earn their degrees abroad. Um, some are taking care of children and families, uh, but many are stuck because they uh, don't know where to start in terms of looking for a job, they may not have sufficient English proficiency or professional connections, or they need uh, access to high quality childcare, which prevents them from even looking for a job. When uh, college educated immigrant women are in the labor force, they tend to work in, uh, many, many work in, in, uh, in jobs that, that are well beyond a bit, I'm sorry, well below their educational and professional training. Uh, they work as cashiers and target, uh, they work as um, nannies, and they work as whole, at home health aides, even though they have uh, a college education. So mm -hmm. altogether, we're talking about 3 million college-educated immigrant women who are underutilized. They represent 
in my opinion, a tremendous pool of uh, workers and human capital potential that we have to unlock. And again, I'm delighted to be part of this important conversation inspired you know, by Gina and the work by uh, and be part of the work that the Urban League Global uh, has been doing uh, for over two, uh, close to two decades um, in, in, in ways to reduce the barriers for immigrants, highly skilled immigrants, women in particular, to employment and tap this incredible potential to help only not immigrant women and their families, but also local employers and communities in which they reside. Thank you for that. I, I love, first, first, I have not actually been here for the two, two decades that Upwardly Global has been here. Um, <laughs> I'm actually not that old. Um, second, I mean, they up, you inspired this conversation, but Upper the Global has been doing this work. For close I know, Jada. <laughs> um, but I, I, what I really like is two things that you've highlighted. One is, is we often talk about our population, um, and we don't recognize that it sounds like it's uh, fifty percent of our women and fifty percent of college-educated women are un or underemployed. So um, that's a huge opportunity miss for us um, if we're not also centering our work on that. I think what I also take away from this conversation is, is you know, there are other barriers. There's childcare, there's elder care, um, there's, there's the difficulty of knowing how to navigate back into the workforce. And so while some of those barriers are shared across gender, some of them are specific also to women. Um, and I really appreciate you saying that um, when we invest in women, we're not only investing in our workforce, but we're investing in families and communities. Because I think oftentimes what we hear around the arguments of ensuring women are accessing the workforce is, is that they're good for our economy. And it's so much more than that. Um, so I really like that you framed it and connected those two dots. Um, I want to turn to Tassiana next. And because I want to talk about these barriers. I mean, you've done extensive research um, in many countries around what some of the barriers are for women and girls to be able to access and succeed in the workplace. And I wanted to ask, what are some of those barriers that you've seen and, and are there shared themes across countries that you've also seen in that research? Um, and I also want to invite you, because I know you have a personal connection to this, um, this work as well, to sort of share your own journey about finding a job here in the US. Absolutely. Well, first of all, thank you so much for the invitation to UPCO. And I'm honored and thrilled to be here and share a little bit of what I've seen around the world and the, the, the program that the Girls on the Road ran in 24 countries and all continents. And more to your point, Tina, I mean, the first thing that we must say that no country, no matter how small or large, cannot survive economically and keep growing without including women in its workforce. And that's, you know, there's so many studies about that. And that's what really trigger, uh, triggers our, our research, which, is, which was done for a book and a documentary. And we saw so many commonalities, you know, in different countries, be that here in the US or, I don't know, in, in, in France or in Rwanda or in Lebanon, I mean, Countries with very different cultures, but for women, they still unfortunately face many uh, of the same challenges. For example, you said about caretaking. In all of these countries, caretaking are, you know, almost a sole responsibility of women, of children, of elderly people, of the house management. It, you know, no matter where you are, the women are considered the ones that have to take care of that. And that really hinders them in terms of opportunities because when you are a working mother, you are naturally taken out of opportunities in the job place. You're not considered for promotions. It hinders that. Or, you know, people will not take you for that new project that will take a lot of, a lot of hours. And or many times you were not even considered to be hired. So that's, you know, really clear. And we see that, we saw that around the world with, with a, you know, it was troubling seeing that. I think that another issue that tackles women is the theme of ambition. And, you know, we as women, we really must approach that with a clear mind in terms of, there's a double standard when you consider women and the workplace and the ambition, and we have to promote that for, you know, young women, 
getting a new country, you're arriving in a new country, you're a refugee, they have to be able to also to share that and to show that and be recognized for that. So, but so many women around the world do not show how ambitious, ambitious they are as they should. And another topic, I think it's women, they said often that they are second guessed about you know, their opinions, their positionings, and we're talking about the workplace. And we saw that happening. I experienced that myself. So for me, and you, you said that's you know, particularly personal for me, this journey, because it is. I'm, I'm a mini immigrant myself, recently arrived in the US. As you mentioned, I'm, I'm from Brazil. And so many times, it doesn't matter how skilled or experienced you are, you are still seen so many times as the foreigner, you know, as someone that maybe you will not be able to contribute and really collaborate. And, and that's tough to face that. In addition to that, also being part of the LGBT community, for me, it adds another layer of fear, I might say, because you never know to this day how people will, you know, embrace you or not. And of course, being a woman, it's, you know, touches everything around it. So for me, being in Accenture, which is, you know, I have recently started there as a partner of Upglow, has been like a dream come true because it certainly has a culture of embracing you as you are. And I think it's absolutely key if we're talking about gender, religion, origin, it, it doesn't matter. You know, you, you're someone, someone there in that workplace that will add you be seen, be heard, be valued. And that's absolutely key. And in my current position, I really think I have the opportunity to amplify that, these values internally and externally, you know, working with partners to really make sure that every single woman, a refugee that arrives in the US, for example, really learns about what Accenture means and stands for. So it's somehow a continuation of my work at the Girls on the Road. I would also say a couple of things that I take away from this conversation is um, women are what we call triple time for. They have, you know, they have child care, elder care responsibilities, especially immigrant women. I think oftentimes we forget that for immigrant women, they're also responsible for their elders. And so the elder care piece, um, it can become a significant part of their time. So there, there's child or elder care, there's a household, and then there's work. And that limits, and I like that you make that connection, but that limits their ability to have space to build professional networks. It limits their ability to be able to engage in skilling and upskilling opportunities and or to really access upward mobility. Um, and so I think, you know, one of the things that we've started to, to do more of it upwardly global is to think about how can we can build peer communities for women, um, as well as how can we connect women to mentors and including women mentors who really also have to navigate those challenges on their own and how they've been able to do that in a professional environment. And how are we giving women that space to actually build community together because they don't have the time to do it organically, nor are there women only spaces where they're able to find and access that easily. Um, so that really resonates with me too. And I think one of the conversations we were having here earlier was how much of our work is confidence building um, and, then, and how much is needed for confidence building? Go ahead. Yeah, yeah. It's it's funny you mentioned that because you know I think it adds to your point earlier that you know, you talk about mentorship and cer certainly mentorship in my case was was key. And I'll tell you why. And I'm I'm you know I would say a seasoned professional, but when you were arriving in a completely new business environment, when you have someone that can really you know start. Uh, translating things for you, what it means in this new environment, it's key. It's not the only solution, far from that. We need mentorship and a lot more, of course, to really you know, tackle this in a very comprehensive way. But having a mentor, it does make a difference. It does make a difference. Some that can really empathize and understand and hear you and offer solutions that at that point you may not be able to see. And that, that certainly was what happened in my case and was very fortunate, you know, to have a mentor that was able to, to guide me as I was, you know, trying to find my way in this new, in this new world. It was an excellent experience for me. And this is key. One very important variable. That's what I wanted to add. Yeah, no, very good. 
Um, so now I want to ask uh, Suhal for you to join us in this conversation. You know, in August, we saw a massive evacuation of Afghans into the United States. We received about 95,000 of them. We also saw a lot of um, women activists um, as part of that, uh, that flow of refugees into the United States, um, in including you know, a, a mix of Afghan women based off in their background coming to the United States. Um, people make a lot of assumptions about refugee women. Um, can you talk a little bit about what some of those hurdles are specifically that you, you see in the Afghan community that women need to overcome and what support and services that we should be providing to, to help them succeed? Um, and I know you also have a personal journey here, so I'm welcome you to share that too. Thank you. Thank you, Gina, and, and thank you to the um, other panelists for the insightful uh, uh, comments and informative presentation. Um, so before answering your question, um, I would like to talk about this group of Afghan women professionals who are in the U.S. now. So who they are, they are professionals, um, very well educated, um, who have either studied inside Afghanistan or um, outside Afghanistan for the past 20 years. And most of them have worked alongside Americans and other internationals. Um, and some of them have been civil society activists, some of them civil servants, um, even uh, women who, who have worked um, in, in a very higher level positions inside the, the government. So this is a very uh, dynamic um, and hardworking group of women uh, that we deal with. And some of the barriers that they face, um, um, firstly, the, the, Tassiana and Jana spoke about childcare. So we come from a very collective culture back home. A, Couples live with families, you know, um, together. And mostly working moms, when they go outside to work, they leave their kids to the grandparents or, or the aunt or any other member of the family. This is something that they do not have here. And, and the cost of childcare here is very high and they cannot afford it. And I have, for example, I have a few friends who back home they used to work they, they used to be professionals but now here they had to leave it and give up their careers because of taking care of their children and this makes it even harder for them later to to enter the u.s job market and compensate for all these lost years and one of the the very most important barriers that they face as you mentioned is the wrong assumptions and biases um, that they face as as women refugees uh, people might think that, uh, okay, uh, I, I have heard that people say uh, Afghan women are not comfortable uh, in working alongside men, um, or uh, people ask, do their husbands let them to work? Or when they see Afghan women with their hijabs on, they might think that they are super conservative or they are, um, um, I don't know how to put it, anti-Western um, values or, or you know, uh, culture, things like that. And these are all wrong assumptions um, because we have had women ministers, diplomats, civil servants. They have not only worked alongside men, but they have also worked alongside um, uh, uh, not only Afghan men, but also men who are coming from other countries back home, right? They were part of huge projects uh, led by the international community. So that, these are some of the wrong assumptions uh, and, and biases that, that they face. Um, and we should, be, we should be mindful of that and know that the, the way they dress or the way they, they, they put their hijabs on has nothing to do with their, their skills and their abilities as, as professionals. And one more thing is that Afghan refugees, especially those coming from, from the war-torn areas, from uh, conflict-affected countries uh, like Afghanistan, uh, people have this kind of condescending look at them. You know, They feel like they have been looking, uh, looked down upon. Uh, and people don't usually believe that they are capable of actually, actually doing a job. That's why they, they face these kind of 
barriers when, when they are um, exploring and navigating the used job market and trying to trying to uh, apply for jobs. And part of it is because I, I think the media plays a, a very huge role in, in shaping these, these assumptions. Um, they focus more on, on women's grievances and needs than uh, on their strengths and, and, and potential. Um, so I think that I think that's very important that we should be um, talking about. Um, moving forward, refugee communities need to have their platform and, and, and narratives about their human, social, and cultural um, conditions. I believe. Um, what what I from my point of view, what what needs to be done is that we should look at we should look at this group because they they have. I mean, we are a country that has been in, in war and conflict for the past 40 years. And this has shaped the, the personalities of Afghan women to be, uh, to be the most uh, resilient and resourceful. Um, and, and employers and, and companies should not um, look at them as, as uh, you know, burdens or, or a quota that, 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 that should be filled, but they should look at them as, as opportunities, you know, as, as people who can bring diverse experiences, who can contribute to, to the uh, US economy, and also who can uh, contribute to the diversity of, of, of their workplace. They should look at them at, as their, um, how should I put it, as their future uh, partners, you know, global partners for the, for the women cause, for, for, you know, things like sisterhood. So that's very important that the companies and, and hiring um, uh, companies need to, need to take into account. And also, Tasia mentioned about mentorship. I think it's, um, I cannot emphasize more on this. It's, it's very important. We need to give extra attention and, and support to uh, women immigrants um, in terms of career development, in terms of providing professional mentorship for them um, and things like that. And we need to also work with employers, with companies to help them overcome their assumptions, their wrong assumptions and, and, and biases. And we need to make sure that they know that these women are not, as the other panelists mentioned, are not only contributing to, to their um, communities, to their families, but also to the US economy. And it's a threefold um, uh, kind of um, return when we when we put um, support and we put um, resources to, to to help these these group of women. And I think that um, they really appreciate any chances and opportunities that they get more than any any of of uh, of us, uh, and they won't take them for granted. Um, I, I, I will just briefly mention that when I was looking for a job, um, so I, I, I felt that only not as a woman, when you are a woman, of course, you face discrimination throughout your life, no matter you're in Afghanistan or you're in the US, where you come from. We all experience that on many occasions in our lifetime. But when you, you are an immigrant woman, that um, as an extra layer and the additional layer of discrimination. And I, I have, I mean, I know that looking for a job is a, is a long process and finding jobs is, is a long process. But still, as I was going through that, I felt that kind of discrimination and bias, despite having worked here in an organization like the UN or despite having a master's degree from uh, an American school like the NYU, I still, thought that I, I felt discriminated against. Um, I, would, um, I was asked questions that were not related to my skills, but to my citizenship and then permanent residency or um, my asylum case. So these kind of questions I, I thought were really discriminatory because um, they were not focused on my skills and experience, but rather on other stuff that, that are like huge blocks that we need to, that we need to uh, overcome. So, I mean, I, you know, it's important what you're saying, Suhal, because one, I don't think we talk enough about the fact that we say, you know, when immigrants come here, they lack a professional network. 
But when women immigrants come here, they also lack a support system. And it's a support system that they relied on in their own communities back home um, to, to be able to, to manage and juggle all the things. And then they come here and they don't have that support system. And, and what, what does that mean for their ability to actually contribute to the workplace? I also really love that you talk about agency, that women have agency and that they have power and that this image of women needing a hand out versus a hand up needs to shift. And that needs to shift not only in the public perception of how we articulate um, what women's capabilities are, but also amongst employers. Um, I think what's been striking to me around the Ukraine crisis is because it's a largely female flow, 90% of refugees are women and girls, um, that there is the conversation about they're, they're not having the ability to work, um, that they're largely going to be on public assistance. Um, and when we say actually 60% of Ukrainian women are college educated, is the fourth most educated country in the world, people are surprised. And again, it's this assumption um, that women equals low skill, low labor as well. Um, and so I take your point about also like the, it's an immigrant narrative and there's a woman narrative. And when they are connected, um, it makes it double, doubly difficult for women. Um, and that this education needs to happen with employers too. Um, we do a lot of work around work authorization and educating employers around work authorization. It's the number one question that we get from employers when we start talking to them. Um, but also just an educating employers about who, who these immigrant women are, who these Afghan women are. Um, I've also gotten questions about um, women's abilities to, Afghan women's ability to work alongside men. And I, I'm shocked myself to hear that. So I just wanna acknowledge that your story rings true as well. And thank you for sharing that. Um, I want to have our last special speaker speak before we go to questions. Um, so some of you will have seen um, Ivana Musa's uh, video in our uh, mother's uh, campaign. Um, Ivana Musa is a journalist from South Sudan. Um, she has worked with UN Radio and other major radio stations in both Sudan and South Sudan. Um, she had to flee Sudan um, for her own safety and came to the United States, um, New York City actually, uh, both pregnant and with a young son um, and without a home to go, go to. Um, and she is uh, you know, an UPGLOW alum at this stage and we're really excited to have her here. Um, Ivana, you have such a powerful story and you have worked um, and advocate for women both in South Sudan and now in your work here in the US. Um, I just wanted to ask if you could talk a little bit about uh, the challenges of restarting your career here. And, and I think the other thing people don't realize is how hard many women fight to be professionals in their home country. And then when they come here, how hard they have to fight to reclaim that. Yes, Gina, thank you very much. And um, uh, yeah, it is a big challenge, challenge back home and challenge here in uh, United States. Um, back home, I was working as a journalist with United Nations for almost 15 years. But to reach to that point, I went through a lot of things, starting from um, the culture barrier, being a woman who fights to go for her education, then um, being a woman who work as a journalist, traveling to many places, and um, then being a woman reporting. Uh, the war and uh, the humanitarian um, violation and human rights violation against women during the war because my last position with the United Nations was a gender affairs officer and I was the head of uh, gender section uh, in Unity State, which is the crisis area. And I'm the only one who used to reach those women after any attack. And I used to report it and that's why I was in trouble and I traveled uh, to US um, uh, running for my life. And when I came to US, uh, it was not easy as Gina before mentioned. You come to a new country having hope that um, you are a professional, you work 15 years with United Nations, everybody knows you. I was a radio presenter, I was TV presenter, I was women activist. When I came here, I came to no way, I don't, I don't know nobody. I was pregnant, I have a child in my hand, 
And I started my life in, in New York uh, homeless shelter. Uh, when I was in the shelter, I was telling myself, you know what, this is a land of opportunity. I'm a professional woman. I will, get, I will get a chance. I will work. There is no problem. I remember um, I spent almost six months every single day. I sent my resume. First of all, I didn't know what is a resume. And uh, you know, when you are in shelter, the case manager, she send you outside to look for jobs. They refer you to places to go and get jobs so that you can get out of the shelter. I used to apply, I used to apply, but nobody want to hire me because I don't know why. Um, maybe because um, as you mentioned before, uh, Gina, because maybe I'm, I'm a woman, maybe because I'm a migrant people, they, they are not, uh, sure if I can do the job or not. I started working as home health aide for almost four years. And uh, I lost my hope. I lost the hope of being professional again. And I used to go to my work and come back because uh, at the end I have children and I had uh, to provide for them um, food in the table. So I had to work, any job, any job just uh, to get money. Then um, uh, I meet um, one, of the orga one of the ladies, she head of the organization, her name is Soshana. She referred me to about the global. And I said, you know what, let me go. Um, it's one of the organization. They will ask me many questions and then I will be stuck here without nothing for another 10 years. <laughs> <laughs> and um, with all that hope, I applied to about the global. And after one year, I get a job as a professional uh, case planner with Arab American Family Support Center. And um, I really appreciate that because I feel now I'm in my place, but it's not easy. Trust me, as a migrant woman in a new country, without no family, without no support. You don't know where you are going. Yes, I have experience. I know what I'm doing. I, I used to beg people in that shelter to beg them. The case manager, I, I used to beg her, please make me your assistant. I don't want money, just I want to work. I just want to show you what I can do. But nobody believe. Nobody think you can do something. And uh, again, everybody say, oh, whenever you go, even for looking for help or support for your children because there is no way. You need to feed somebody. You are here running for your life. You hear a lot of things. Oh, you came here to get our resource. You came here to, to, to get the, 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 uh, the money from public assistance. You hear a lot of things. But at the end, if you um, is stuck in your plan and if you um, believe in yourself, you can reach your dream if you find the support. And finally, thank God, I found the support from Abordly Global and I managed to get my job. And um, I'm really satisfied and I'm, I'm happy because I'm also working with uh, immigrant women from different countries. They have different stories also. And soon I will be refer some people to you, uh, Gina, in Abordly Global <laughs> to fight for them job. <laughs> That's good, yeah. we're here. <laughs> yeah. I know I have just five minutes and I like to talk. I know my story is, is long and I don't want to uh, talk too much. Um, if you have any question for me, I will leave it for you because I don't want to take that, uh, the time. Ivana, you're wonderful and we love you. And we, I love hearing you speak every single time. I think this is my third or fourth time hearing you speak and I learned something new each time. So thank you for always making time for us. Um, and I, what you say about the loss of identity resonates. Um, I think many of our, our, our community feel like they've lost identity. And I just wanna say for women who fight hard to get a professional career and educated in their own countries from Afghanistan or from Sudan or from wherever else, and then to lose that identity here is a double hit. Um, I also wanna say, you know, one of the reasons why we're having this conversation today at Upwardly Global or we're bringing this to you is because we know that women face different barriers and we know that we need to address these additional barriers in order to ensure that not only are we helping them succeed, but we're reaching more women that aren't able to access our programs for all the reasons that these women mentioned today. Um, 
I used to work uh, in international development humanitarian response, and we had uh, a colleague of mine had developed a value chain analysis. And I asked her, why didn't you integrate gender into that? And her response was, if a man can drive a car, a woman can drive a car. But the reality is, it's harder for women to access finance in order to get a loan to get that car. The reality is, women might have different preferences of the cars that they want to get, and they might not be involved in the design of those cars. The reality is, some places, it's hard for women to be able to, to get a driver's license, and or if they do have a driver's license, they're treated differently on the road. So. That, with that said, you know, we are really organizing and recognizing that we do need to center our work around women as well. And we're glad to have helped all of these incredible women um, get them on their journey. And we're looking forward to doing so much more. Um, so I think we have some questions and I'm assuming there will be a voice that comes on that asks the question. There's a question from Heather Riley. Heather, do you wanna just go ahead and ask your question? Sure, happy to. Um, really grateful for each of your stories. Thank you for sharing it. Hit home and gave me a lot to personally think about. So really appreciate it. Um, would love your thoughts on employers and where you've seen this happen successfully. Obviously, they're key to making um, to fixing this problem is them taking risks on people and taking chances. And two questions. One, are there things that we at Upwardly Global should be thinking about in terms of how to engage employers differently to bring home this message? And then two, any examples of where you've seen it work really well? And anyone can answer. I kind of threw it out to the entire panel. So if anyone's passionate about that one, feel free to jump in. I, I can certainly say something about Accenture. I'm obviously a new joiner, but from what I've seen, from what you know, my interactions, uh, as I mentioned earlier, Accenture is the type of organization that every organization should strive for. It's really to see a person as they are, you know, with all the flaws and the good things and the bad things. But what I mean is uh, it doesn't matter, you know, if you have the same opinion that I do have, but see me as a person, a whole person, and let's achieve something together. Let's build something together. I think that's the whole idea behind it. it, it it's not rocket science, you know, from my point of view, you know, to, to establish and, and put together a culture that is focused on people and what we as people can achieve together. Doesn't matter where you're from, which language I speak primarily, you know, the faith that I pray for, or if I am a man or a woman, but see me as a person. Of course, I have, I'll bring my experience, my set of skills and help me develop new skills, help me navig navigate these new waters. So that's, that's what I've been seeing in Accenture. And there's so many other examples, you know, to really see everyone and each one of us has a multitude of, of perspectives and, and being able to talk to us in a very clear and direct manner. And, and transparency and, and really seeing me. I think that's, that's the key, you know, an organization that is able, truly, genuinely able to see me. And as Johan said, not to fill a quota. Don't do that. Absolutely not. Be intentional, truly. And then you get the best of me, of any one of us, you know, because we'll be allies. I think that the main, the main message, be intentional, learn from others, like, you know, see what other companies, other organizations are doing about it and, and learn from them. And also learn from their mistakes as well <laughs> and exchange and try to build something better and be, you know, learn everything new every day about these women, these refugees, these immigrant people that are arriving in your shores and really just try to know them. It's gonna benefit everybody. Um, Heather, definitely uh, an important uh, stakeholder in this in, in this field of reducing brain waste um, uh, uh, is employers. Uh, I read today a very interesting um, news that the Biden administration uh, requested that. Uh, across the government, across the federal government uh, agencies, 
start uh, hiring based on skills and competences rather than degrees. And of course, I immediately thought about uh, underemployed immigrants because for many, the challenge is um, to prove that their international education and, and experience um, is valid in the US context. So where, where, where we have um, systems that would assess people based on their competencies rather than just relying on a piece of paper that might be difficult to, um, to get uh, for all sorts of reasons, this would be a great system. And another um, um, news related to that is that many employers are already shifting toward uh, hiring based on skills rather, rather than just uh, degrees and you know, a, a, a hard copy prove that you have accumulated hours of education. So this is a good, a good news. And of course the federal government uh, is a huge employer, uh, but it also uh, provides um, um, leadership and ideas for, for other employers. So the question of course is how to let the federal government, the state governments, as employers, as well as private employers, know about this population. And the, the work that Upper the Global has been doing um, for a number of years is really pioneering in this regard is because uh, recognizing the employers could be a, a, a door or a door open or a door closed. Um, and and so it's, it's a matter of kind of slowly keeping this conversation going, engaging through uh, mentorships, through internships, and through other opportunities where employers who might be cautious about hiring immigrants for all sorts of reasons, uh, allow them to experience uh, these, uh, having these immigrant workers uh, in a less risk, uh, risky form at first, and then as, as examples, as many magazine examples shows is that the uh, employers uh, begin to appreciate and, and really value uh, the loyalty that immigrant workers who feel that they finally someone invested in them uh, demonstrate to, to employers. So this is a great, really great opportunity. And another uh, point I wanna mention is that this work needs to be done um, on a constant basis. So when we have a crisis, uh, we don't have to suddenly come up with solutions on the spot. And the prime example is the um, uh, five to six million Ukrainian Ukrainians who um, left Ukraine um, in search of, however, temporary uh, protection because of the war. And now both the governments and employers are trying to, to figure out uh, what are they going to do with this population? Um, so for many of them, it's, it's kind of the first time when they have to realize that A, they could be doing something and B, what it is that they could be doing. So as employers are engaged in this process on a continuous basis, we will be much better prepared for whatever shocks that we, we, we may uh, experience as, a, as in kind of an economic and social system. Just to add um, just two points. They, they need to know how, how diverse and rich the ex uh, immigrant women's experience are. Like they bring diversity and richness to the workplace. And secondly, they are very adaptable because they, have, they are coming from other country and they have started from, I mean, very basic small things that look very um, ordinary to us from building their credit history to renting a place to exploring their neighborhoods and building contacts. I think that's, that's really important that, that should be talked about uh, their adaptability and the, the diverse experience that they bring to the workplace. And I would just add that Upwardly Global does have a DEI working group for employers where we try to do just this, not only to educate um, on the richness of this uh, talent pool and to help employers imagine that when we think of DEI communities, we should be also thinking of immigrants and refugees, and we should also be thinking of them at the mid and the high skill level, um, but also like 
the learning that you were talking about, um, Tatiana, which is what's working, what's not working. Um, uh, Jana, like this new legislation, how might that translate for an employer? So um, excited to be doing some of that work at, at, at Upgrade Be Global too. Um, do we have any last questions or Rebecca, how do you wanna wrap this up? I think we're probably, there's so much richness in this call and there's so much more work to be done together. We're so deeply appreciative, but I think we're probably hitting the end of our, our time to speak right now. I know Rebecca Fishman asked a, a good and very pragmatic question and Ivana, I appreciate your note there too about the role of, of coaches and trainers and, and also actively empowering uh, the women who are part of our program. Um, and wanted to just thank each and every one of you. It's very moving that um, each of you has a personal story, which you shared some of during this call. And Ivana, very moving to hear your story again. And, uh, and each of you is also playing such a critical role in actively now helping to repair and improve um, the systems that we have and support individuals. And that's just extraordinary. And it's it's you know, more than what we could wish for. We look forward to working with each of you. I think with that and understanding that we didn't cover nearly everything, but that there's a lot of immense, immense goodwill and fantastic resources in each of you and so many of the people on the call to move this work forward. Um, I'm going to um, pass the mic, so to speak, to Sonia Lin, who is a member of our leadership council and a uh, wonderful activist and friend, um, an immigrant activist and um, works right now uh, for a federal agency. And she's going to speak very briefly about an exercise that was done um, to literally share privilege and to learn. Um, and then we'll conclude this part of our board meeting. And thank you all so much, Sonia. Thank you, Rebecca, and hi, everybody. I feel really honored um, to join this incredible conversation and panel today. Um, so I'm humbly joining as a member of the Washington, D.C. Leadership Council, um, which I joined a couple of years ago as a way of really getting more involved with Upwardly Global and meeting some people in D.C. because I was new to the city a few years ago. And I want to share with you super briefly about a really um, amazing project. Um, that Upwardly Global and um, different leadership councils around the country have partnered on um, recently to reach out to alumni um, and to learn more about their experiences with Upwardly Global and encourage uh, stronger bonds and relationships and uh, kind of work together um, with the organization. Um, and I just want to say um, like huge shout out to Upwardly Global, to Rebecca for your leadership and vision um, for this project and to the work of several uh, LC like champions, uh, Tori Travers and Tej Mehta and Susan Thornton. Um, you know, they really set up a, a process by which um, we members of the LC could kind of easily get in touch with alumni of the program um, and have a really great conversation with them about how working with the program really made a difference for them in their job search. Um, these were really fun, rewarding conversations um, and gave me the opportunity to understand with much greater specificity. Um, I'm sorry, I have a five-year-old who's just interrupted, but it's, it gave me an opportunity to understand how upload really makes a difference um, and to appreciate, you know, for the 10,000th time, but it's important each time to get this reminder um, about the incredible skill sets and experiences and energy um, that immigrants bring to the United States. Um, my most recent conversation was with a woman who is fluent in four languages, um, including English, has an MBA from abroad, has experience in digital marketing and communications. She came to the United States, spent eight months looking for a job with no avail, um, no hits, and it was really working with Upglow and with her coach at Upglow that helped her revise her approach um, and uh, land a position that she's really happy with today. Um, so. Um, just want to share that. I think um, it's a great community building opportunity um, and, you know, exactly what I was looking for in getting more involved um, with Upglow. Uh, with that, I will put myself on mute. Um, <laughs> say goodbye, Billy. <laughs> Thank you so much. We'll, we'll put a link in for uh, the volunteering and mentorship program, which is, you know, a way to activate. We don't want anybody to leave the call without 
feeling inspired to, to take a step and do something. Um, I'm gonna turn over to Steve Osler, who's the vice chair of our board with tremendous gratitude. Thank you, Rebecca. Um, Sonia, that was so cool. Mm -hmm. oh. That was so cool to be able to see you um, in real life doing exactly what we were talking about. <laughs> um, I feel really humbled to be a part of this and I, I'm the only man that's speaking mm -hmm. and um, do so really with humility and thankful for all that I've learned today. Um, I'm really excited to be part of an organization that takes these issues seriously. We, we do have a lot of work to do and uh, I, I don't walk in the moccasins that you all have walked in, but want to uh, tell you how much I respect the journey that, you, that you're on and the way in which you're trying to help change things so that it's easier and better. And up, at Upwardly Global, we take these issues really seriously and we're, uh, we're trying to make sure that we support all immigrants and refugees, but we recognize that the journey that women have is particularly challenging. We're right in the middle of a campaign right now. We're trying to support a thousand um, women, refugees and immigrants. And I wouldn't do my job if I didn't ask for you to help support our campaign. Um, we'll post the link in the chat. It's also on our website, but if you can give, um, your contributions actually do really make a difference to people and help us to help more people um, as they make this journey. So on behalf of our board and um, the other men in the room, thank you really for what you do and continue to help us to learn what we can do to support you. Gene, I'll turn it back to you. Um, I'm so thrilled to be having this conversation. I'm so thrilled to, to have so many wonderful people at and connected to Upwardly Global to be engaging in this conversation. I'm glad that so many of you joined. Um, I think we will have the hashtag she persisted and changed it to she just got the job. So um, thanks everybody and um, enjoy the rest of your day. <laughs>